Well, happy whatever day this is that you're watching us. Uh, this is Richard Rosen, Winnipeg's friendliest undertaker. As many of you know, I've been running a, uh, a series of um, interviews on, um, on a various number of topics uh, in the de death care and estate industries to increase death literacy, uh, topics such as green burial and digital assets, to name just a few. Now, as a funeral director, you can only imagine that uh, it's really quite uncomfortable sometimes to be able to talk to people about their own planning and, and uh, finding a way to do that in a good, uh, upbeat, uh, and a positive way. Maybe I'll start about uh, talking about, oh, we, we both like to canoe, but to, to, to steer the conversation back into things that are important and relevant and timely for everybody is, is technology because all of our lives are impacted every single moment. And uh, that seems to be a good place uh, to start. And it's also where we're going with our conversations here today. Our goal with all of the digital information sessions that we're holding is to raise your level of awareness and uh, to, to really talk about the importance of considering your digital life when you're estate planning. This is the disclaimer, okay? I, I should have a little banner underneath that says disclaimer. Uh, we're not providing advice and this really isn't a substitution for advice. We really encourage you that you, you seek qualified professional advice in the jurisdiction that you're in. And because we're delving into the world of technologies, we're, we're gonna be mentioning vendors and service providers to illustrate points. It's really not to endorse any particular organization, product or service. So that is now said. My co-host today is Sharon Hartung, the author of Your Digital Undertaker. Sharon and I have been collaborating for a number of years now. And uh, today we are doing part two of our, our, our interview with Lee Poskanzer. He is the CEO and founder of Directive Communication Systems. It's the first and only estate management solution that assists attorneys and personal representatives organize and contact personal accounts to fulfill the individual's final wishes. So Sharon, welcome back. And Lee, thanks for joining us. And Sharon, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Richard. Great to be back here with Lee. <laughs> we are, Lee and I have had some amazing, wonderful discussion in the space. And uh, Richard and I never talk about sports. We talk about web domains of all things. So talk about how geeky we are, I suppose. Um, but back to the topic at hand, we spent the last time in part one talking a lot about estate planning. So a firm like DCS has a solution for attorneys and estate firms that address some of the estate planning requirements of our digital assets by providing a digital vault. Then a firm or attorneys would provide their clients access on an individual basis in which they would upload information such as their social media and their other digital memories or where one can find their digital photos, etc. So why don't we turn part two and have a conversation about estate administration. So perhaps uh, uh, a client has proactively used the platform such as yours to upload information. Um, they have identified the username of a specific account. They have identified the directives. And as uh, Lee mentioned in part one, uh, he does not collect passwords, which have a variety of challenges, uh, notwithstanding the terms of service by the service provider generally doesn't allow uh, password sharing at all. So with that, um, perhaps uh, the uh, testator uh, or the will maker has become incapacitated or they have died. And now the executor needs to step up to their job in terms of closing down the person's life. So what happens on the estate administration side if someone has used your pre-planning pre solution? Absolutely. And again, thank you for having me, I, uh, Richard and Sharon. Uh, uh, excited to be here. Uh, I, wouldn't be, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the planning side on how we get to administration. So when clients enter their accounts into and building their portfolio, we too, at the same time, are building our base database of custodians so that we have what we call an IRG or a CRG, which is a reference guide of all the protocols, submission methods, requirements of that custodian. So when the time comes, we know what we need to gather. And if there's a, a custodian that's entered, let's say the Winnipeg, Winnipeg bike shop, we're going to reach out to the Winnipeg Bike Shop when we learn that it's part of a person's portfolio, 
and we're going to learn what do we need to do. In some cases, they may say, just send us the name, send us the information. Other larger sites may have complete and complicated processes for managing the account holder death. But we're going to be able to streamline that information and make it into an easy to use solution so that when it comes time for administration, we can then fulfill the directives for that client. When our client passes away, uh, the fiduciary or the lawyer will contact us. They can either reach us by phone, by email. The lawyer can log in. Uh, and we will begin, uh, once informed, the administration process. And we'll build a package. So we'll be getting the obituary. We'll be getting the death certificate. We'll be getting any letters of authorization we may need. And we'll, begin, we'll be getting all that documentation. We'll already have in our system the account holder identification, the directive, and the basic information of the individual name, address, and phone number so that we can now tie the decedent to being the custodian's account holder. And we can then provide the data logs of where directives have been decided, what direction directive options have been made, and who they want to disclose the account contents to. We put together the package. We're ready to go. The estate, uh, in this case, an executor, would tell us when they want to send us, when to send the package. They cannot dictate to us what changes need to be made, but they can tell us when to send the package and we'll send it out. We send it to the submit through the submission methods that are preferred by that custodian. Uh, and again, it can be via email in, in most cases or uploaded really. And uh, then we'll check on that, see the status, what have they done with the disclosure, what have they done in terms of action-oriented directives, and we'll be able to communicate an update to the executor. Uh, what we have found is that in most cases, well, our requests are carried out within 14 days. So we are able to get it done efficiently. We are not really questioned. We haven't had a challenge yet, with the exception of one time where uh, a dot, we had to provide another document. We got it back to them within 24 hours. And then 24 hours later, the, uh, the email was disposed. Uh, so we're efficient and we're, we actually prevent the lawyer from having to play account manager because they don't know the customer service. They don't know the tools they need to do. They're gonna spend more time researching and trying to understand what they, they need to provide uh, or the executor could be doing the same thing, which is going to take a lot of time, energy, and money. And if you're looking at the average person today having 200 accounts, you're going to be spending a lot of time. Where is that Gmail? What does Google allow for? What can I do? Our system really ties it up nicely in a box and puts a bow on it and then takes care of it. Okay, let's uh, let's explore uh, two digital assets. Let's take a simple one and then a more complicated one, which may need uh, some additional planning. Let's take a simple one that I know that uh, people uh, put a lot of value or, or around is loyalty points. So let's take a user. Uh, somebody has uh, their law firm has your solution. They've got the client's got access. Uh, you've uploaded the fact that you have loyalty point program A and loyalty po program point B. You may not know the terms of service underneath it. Um, they've specified they'd, they'd like their loyalty points to go to someone close to them. And then the, the, the client has passed away. So what happens with loyalty points? Do the points get transferred or what's, what goes on underneath the covers? I, I'm laughing because it's never as simple as we'd like it to be. Yeah. So it really depends on the the uh, organization, right? Airlines don't want the outstanding liability on their books. So more and more of them are saying, you can't transfer the points or some are saying only to the spouse mm -hmm. and other ones are saying only to charitable deductions so that people can get write-offs. Uh, so the loyalty program, what we do is we discover what's available and then inform the client through our system of what they can do. American Express, for example, those loyalty points have financial value uh, as, as, as any of the ones that potentially could be transferred do. Uh, but those have 
those are tied to a credit card. They may be still accumulating because it's a joint account. So we're going to make sure that we're going to dispose of them as to what the estate needs to do. Do they get transferred to the other cardholder? Do they get donated? Mm. Do they have to be financially recognized and settled with the estate so the accountant has to get involved? Most critical thing is that we're keeping them transparent so they're not forgotten about. And if you've accumulated 200,000 points on air, can on, um, on air miles, uh, you're going to find that that could be worth a couple trips, but you don't want to forget them. You don't want to lose them because you simply forgot that you have an online account. So we make sure that those accounts are visible and actionable. Right, and it's an important point because one would think all loyalty point or reward point programs have the same terms of service, but they absolutely don't. They have individually different uh, terms of service and keeping up to date of them is sometimes hard. I do recommend folks think of their top three digital assets. They'd be devastated and spend a little extra time planning those um, using a tool like yourself or even on a piece of paper. So let's shift gears now to talk a little bit about, we don't have all the time in the day as, as you and I can get into it, but let's talk about a little more complex digital asset. Suppose that uh, you, um, during the pandemic, you started a Shopify store or you sold your art online, something like Threadless or Society6. Um, you suddenly have an email account, a, a little website, some software to run it. What do we have to consider in dealing with more complex digital assets that are inter interrelated in some way? As you said, that's quite complex because you're talking about an entire ecosystem that is intertwined and it's enmeshed with itself. And you, if you have, a, let's say, for example, a domain name, you may also have a different host provider and then a security provider and then someone who's monitoring privacy and then another organization or independent consultant that's monitoring the emails. And that's just the beginning. You still have your content that you, the owner has, your, maybe your account holders, maybe emails are tied to that domain name and that organization. There's a lot there. And the concern is what happens if any of those elements collapse? And in the area of a state, because terms of service agreements may be signed as an individual and not as an organization, the privacy becomes even that much more critical. And there are a number of stories that we've heard recently where businesses have collapsed because the person managing all those components of that business died. Everything was signed for by them as an individual. And when the company went to transfer everything over to them, to the next person, every organization denied them access. Every organization denied them transference, uh, all the content of their sites are lost. The value of the site is lost. The income generated from the sites is lost. And so you find that it's the, these companies are not necessarily willing to work with you because they have to protect the privacy data, the privacy of that account holder, even though it may be a business. What I found very interesting was when the, this particular individual went back to the domain name issuer, uh, in this case, it, it was GoDaddy. GoDaddy had said to them, well, unfortunately, you're gonna have to wait for those domain names to expire and then you can repurchase them, which means that they could only get the domain name, but they couldn't get anything else associated with it. They're gonna spend a lot of money rebuilding just the websites and hope that they don't lose account holders. And it's all gonna to have to take place over time and they have to hope that nothing collapses while they're waiting. So we're talking about complex digital assets affecting domain names, YouTube channels, Instagram influencers, uh, pretty much anything that may occur online. As you, as you know, or may, um, you may or may not know, domain names are especially delicate because we have expiration dates on our subscription. Right. And if they pass and nobody activates the estate or activates the account or information within that grace period, that domain name will be redeposited back to the open market so someone can pick it up. 
And that recently happened here in Toronto with Sick Kids Hospital, where they lost one of their domain names and a cannabis company picked it up. Luckily, the cannabis company recognized the situation and gave it back to the hospital. But you can see even large organizations can make mistakes and have things fall through the cracks and they can have permanent damage. Yes, and we've gotten pretty deep on the deep end of this uh, digital vault conversation, which can be a bit overwhelming. Suffice it to say, I think that um, complex digital assets, whether they are one significant digital asset or they interact together as a, IT as a system, requires some planning, some of the planning that your own IT department and your business might need to do. We now do need to bring home. We need to document what those uh, assets are that make up that particular system. We need to make sure that we've used as much as the pre-planning functionality and administrator access that's available. We need to even lay out the architecture so people understand how the pieces relate to each other, document, uh, put some business con continuity planning, and then wrap it with the legal and tax documentation that gives other people rights to access it. Again, it's a big topic. I'm not trying to solve it on this call, <laughs> but I'm just trying to indicate that there's work to be done in that space. Now, if I bring it back to the beginning where we can all start, Starting with a digital asset inventory is terrific. And even then that can be overwhelming. Let's start with the top three digital assets of significance and get some plans around them. And it's wonderful that the tech entrepreneurs have entered the space, uh, people like you Lee that have solutions for law firms and estate firms and individuals so that they can begin the process of capturing their digital assets, applying some of the estate requirements such as directives and other things and then having a, a facility that will help the executor who is now a digital executor deal with it upon death is terrific. Now, importantly, where can people find a demo of your solution and how can they reach out and contact you if they'd like to hear more? Sure. Uh, we have multiple ways to reach out to us. Uh, we, if you visit directive communications, plural, .com, uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, about our services, both for the lawyer or even wealth manager, as well as their clients. Uh, as, and uh, you can also find information for you as an individual if you don't have a professional advisor. So there's enough information for both sides. Uh, you can also reach us at info at directivecommunications.com or call us at 1-800-372-8121. Again, 800-372-8121. I, I, now I feel like I'm a, 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 an infomercial there. Call today it's okay. and, and you'll get uh, a Ginsu knife. But, uh, but uh, uh, we have multiple ways. We have chats also available. We have webinars that people can learn and see a demo. And we can also schedule personalized demos for uh, those that are looking for it. You're also on LinkedIn and Twitter. As well. Yeah, they're on LinkedIn, okay. Twitter, and Facebook, and, and Facebook. you can reach us through those so, so uh, through social media as well. Fantastically, it's always terrific uh, catching up with you and talking on the digital asset topic. There's easy ways to start, and then there's some more complex things that the industry needs to evolve and address, which is uh, wonderful to have the conversation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Richard, who's generously brought us together so that we can have these conversations and share our information with everyone. Great, thank you, Sharon, and thank you very much, Lee, for all your insights and, and your zeal for this conversation and topic. It's, uh, it's really important uh, work that you're doing in, a, in an emerging area of technology with digital assets. Um, I came to this because uh, I met Sharon through LinkedIn, and then when I started to, to hear more and more about what was going on, uh, when I sit down with client families to pre-plan, uh, I find I was spending almost half of my time talking about digital assets and having people look as if they're just the deer in the headlights and well what can we do and how can we how can we deal with these sorts of things and so that the the estate will be dealt with easily and for people like yourselves and others that are falling into this it's really important for us as a funeral industry as well because we are sitting down with folks and we're one of those pieces of uh, not only the lawyer um, and also the financial planners as well, um, where these things are critical. It's also for our industry. So uh, hopefully down the road, not, not too far down the road, that uh, our industry will be reaching out to yourself and others to, uh, to really get a better understanding of how we can help our client families as well.
So we thank you again. Uh, keep safe, keep smiling. This is Richard Rosen, Winnipeg's friendliest undertaker from Winnipeg, signing off. <laughs>